The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to Jesus, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Last week's Gospel reading ended with Jesus saying, The last will be first, and the first will be will be last. Today's Gospel reading began with uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, fighting to ride shotgun next to Jesus, right? What's interesting is that the lectionary that assigns what we will read, what we will talk about week to week, um, it, it left out three verses that were between the ending of last week's and the beginning of this week's reading. This is what the lectionary left out. They were on the way going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going ahead of them, and they were amazed, but those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and experts in the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him severely and kill him. Yet, after three days, he will rise again. And I'm wondering why those who decades ago put together the readings for the Christian Church for every Sunday, why they would leave those vital verses out. And I don't know the answer, but one possibility is that these readings fall, fall, in the fall, October 17th. We're nowhere near Holy Week or Easter. The part of the story where they go to Jerusalem and all these things that Jesus predicted that we wouldn't have read except that I just did, it wasn't part of the narrative um, that we tell now. We tell it at Easter, and so they struck them. And so then, if you read that first as it is written and then tell today's story, what the sons of Zebedee do sounds even worse. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the audacity of saying that to your teacher who you believe to be the son of God right after he predicts his grisly, unjust death and resurrection? Can you imagine that your next words out of your mouth would be, we want you to do whatever we want. No wonder they left that part out, right? The thing is, 
I always feel when I read this story, and it's in all three, three of four Gospels, so we hear it a lot, I always feel kind of bad for James and John. I feel like I want to protect their dignity. I want to somehow make them a little less awkward, a little less self-centered, a little less totally missing the point. And maybe that's because I want myself to be a little less about totally missing the point because we do too, right? We are we have much in common with these audacious disciples who want to sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus in his glory. You know, I mean, just the fact that they want to sit makes me confess, oh, I am good at sitting. I am really good at it. I would, I would be able to do that job so well, right? This week I started swimming again, my uh, sport of choice when, I, um, when I'm attending better to my physical body that God blessed me with. And I was uncomfortable. It's harder. I can't swim as far or as fast as I once could. It's safe to say I was both out of my comfort, comfort zone and back in it. And I, I feel like that's what Christians do a lot today is we understand that we're not supposed to ask to sit at Jesus' right and left hand. We understand that the last will be first is about servanthood. We understand that Jesus came not to be uh, served, but to serve as the grace-filled model of what his followers would do as well. And so periodically, we get back in the water and do some serving and get to the other end of the pool and climb out and get go back home and become warm and sit in front of the TV with our hot soup and feel good about what we just did. I think what Jesus is getting at here when he reminds the disciples, you do not know what you're asking, but you will, right? When he says that, um, it's a word of grace. If they knew what would happen as they continued to follow Jesus and be transformed by God's Holy Spirit, where that would lead them, they might turn and walk away right now, right? So that's kind of interesting. 25 years ago, Philip Yancey wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. It begins this way. I told a story in my book, The Jesus I Never Knew, a true story that long afterward continued to haunt me. I heard it from a friend who works with the down and out in Chicago. A prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told me she had been renting out her daughter, two years old, to men. She made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could earn on her own in a night. She had to do it, she said, to support her own drug habit. I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable. I'm required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman. At last, I asked if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They would just make me feel worse. The first time I read that, I was struck by the prostitute's perception of the church. I wondered what the church needed to do so that women, men, people in dire straits would see it as a place of res refuge, a shelter from the storm, a place where people would sit on the ground and listen to their stories. 
try to understand more what they were going through in their life. What would it take? I think it might take a pandemic. I think it might take a worldwide pandemic when suddenly it feels like the ground beneath our very feet has shifted. When people are talking in the news about uh, supply chains being disrupted and we are building bigger pantries and buying things in bulk. I think maybe a worldwide pandemic when we cannot even completely safely take shelter in our sanctuaries together being restored by the rituals of our faith. We cannot on a regular basis bask in the glory of the Lord in the way we are accustomed to doing. Now don't get me wrong, the church does many things well. The body of Christ feeds people the world over. Lutheran Immigration Services has been rescuing and um, set, helping set up households and systems to help refugees from all over the world for as long as we have been a church. This is not to say that we don't help. It is to say, though, that we get in and out of the water. And what Jesus is talking about as we follow him is a total transformation into a new way of looking at the world, a new way of life. Right now, we are watching on Netflix a 10-episode show called Made, M-A-I-D. Some of you I know have watched it too, and if you haven't, and if you are privileged enough to have Netflix, I highly encourage you to watch it. It is the story of a young woman fleeing a violent relationship with her boyfriend and taking her three, their three-year-old daughter with her. She becomes a maid as a means of putting bread on the table and a roof over their heads. And watching what she has to go through to get monies provided by our uh, systems, many of which are obsolete, all of which require way too much of the one who needs the help. What she goes through um, will not leave you soon after you see it. It takes it from if you're walking in a downtown area and someone asks you for a couple bucks, you may give it to them. You may even take them to lunch and get to know them a little bit. But this show takes you in to the 24 hours before they saw you and all of the things they may have had to go through simply because they are poor, simply because they live below the poverty line. And that, understanding that does something to us. It heightens our sense of empathy. It gives us more of a um, sense of urgency to get involved, to do something different. I know of churches who have in the last five to 10 years, and I'm sure it happened before that, but I know of some who the congregation decided after a time to sell their building and worship in a much more humble place. And the building was turned into a homeless shelter and a place where people could always get a meal. And I think about that and what it would have taken for the congregations to all agree that they are gonna sell this beautiful building on this beautiful piece of land where they were terribly comfortable for the sake of those who were hungry and homeless. There is a scene in The Maid. There's a scene in which this young mother's three-year-old daughter is coughing she's sick she has a fever and the and she's afraid the mother brings the little girl into bed with her and as 
they are tossing and turning. The child is coughing and sweating. The mom looks at the wall in her bedroom, which is seeping with black mold. She, the next day, asks her, secure, her maintenance man when he is going to get to the mold in their apartment. Takes a couple more episodes before he does anything. But when he, d he does, and they pull back some of the paint on the wall, you see the extent of the black mold that is covering the under layer like thick ivy. It made me feel sick to my stomach. And it was interesting because I was reminded of when my youngest child was three year old and he had terrible asthma. And I took him out on the deck, bundled in a quilt um, in the middle of a snowy night because that's where he could breathe best. We sat in this lawn chair. The next day when I went to the pharmacy to get his prescriptions, and gave them my insurance card. The woman who had done this right before me also had a child about the same age and was getting the identical prescriptions. She had no insurance card. She ended up paying full price for these prescriptions using two different Visa cards because there wasn't enough money left on one. I was flabbergasted. It was one of the first times in my life where I had seen up close and personal the difference between having insurance and not having it. I wondered for weeks later, what did she do the next month when she needed it since she just maxed out her cards? I wondered how she would ever climb out of that kind of debt. I was grateful for having insurance. It troubles me still today, and it should. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It means that we create environments where people like this prostitute in this story and that mother with no insurance think to come for help. It creates communities of people that worry less about how clean their clothing is when they walk into the building and worry more about those who will not walk into the building because they can't clean their clothes because they don't have the change for a laundromat. And what I'm hoping at this time in our life church is that in our discomfort of 2021 and all the problems that we can no longer escape from. I wonder if this church is being reformed, transformed. I wonder if we will one by one by one create congregations that are easier for people to run to. If we will protect what we have a little less and share it with the world a little bit more. In the end of today's gospel, Jesus assures the disciples that in fact, they will drink the cup that Jesus drinks. They will be baptized with the baptism experience that Jesus had. They say, we're ready to drink from it. And Jesus says, certainly with love, oh, you will. If you are troubled by the extent of pain in the world, the extent of injustice, the number of people are hungry. If you are wondering, what is the mission of the church in a time of pandemic? I would say it is even more, even more, being willing to set down the desire to ride shotgun, to sit on Jesus' right hand and left hand and bask in his glory while all of the angels sing. And it is more about realizing 
that the people we are called to serve change us, that in serving them, we will be served by the grace of God that transforms us a little bit of a time so as not to completely shock us, but continues to call us out of our comfort zone into the water that gives life to all. Oh, <laughs> 